I'm going to call to order this regular meeting of the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Emergency Management Committee meeting. Today is October 22nd, 2014. I'm Council Member Blong Yang, Chair of this committee. With me today are the following committee members, Council Members Kevin Reich, Lene Pomisano, Cam Gordon, and Abdi Warsami. And I believe Council President may be joining us in a little bit. Uh, today we have four items on our agenda. Two of those items are consent items. And I will read all four items. Um, the first item is uh, to authorize the rental agreement with props on wheels for their use of a police department's mobile command vehicle for use in a television show with a fee of $750 to be charged. And this will be referred to Ways and Means. The second item is to authorize a contract agreement with Hennepin County for Minneapolis Police Department to provide police detox van services for 2015 to 2017 with a 2015 contract amount of $237,000 roughly. Uh, and this one will be referred to Ways and Means as well. Uh, we have two items on the discussion agenda. Uh, <clears throat> one of the items is to authorize an amendment with contract C37911 with employee strategies increasing by 21,000 for a new total not to exceed $115,000 and to extend the contract period to December 31st, 2014. And this is with emergency communications. Uh, the next item is to report back on a direction to research and offer a legal opinion, opinion on or before October 22nd, 2014 on whether the city of Minneapolis has a legal authority under civil rights laws to enforce a ban on the use of the name Redskins, as well as a ban on the use of the image worn by the Washington DC professional football team while playing in the city of Minneapolis at the stadium operated by the University of Minnesota, and that will be presented by the city attorney's office. So with the first two items, um, the first two consent items, um, council members, anyone want to pull either of those items out for discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor of the first two, first two items, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, the third item is, with emergency communications, and I imagine that's with uh, Ms. Hunt. Good afternoon. The uh, just a brief overview. You've got you've received the request for council committee action, and the request is to increase uh, the employee strategies contract by both um, the amount and the length of the um, contract term. It's uh, to allow us to continue the work that we started earlier this year in our employee engagement and workplace culture initiatives and to complete uh, some additional recommendations that employee strategies have made in supporting uh, the work that we've done so far. Do you have Count any questions? Right Council members, any questions? Um, Ms. Ms. Hunt, I just have a question with regards to this uh, increase of $21,000. Um, why was there a need for that increase? I'm sorry, the, the question was why the increase? Right. Because uh, originally the scope of the contract um, was under $50,000. We extended it once uh, to continue the work. And this $21,000 is uh, the estimate of what it will take to complete the work that we started and um, support the culture change initiatives through the end of the year, do a recap uh, survey on how we've done, and um, uh, that's gonna require additional time. Some of the original time uh, was probably underestimated that it would take working with a 24-hour um, operation, trying to reach everyone, um, coordinating our retreats and so forth that um, that just take more planning and time than uh, we initially uh, estimated. And this money will be, be coming out of 911's budget? Yes. That, okay. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. Uh, so part of this um, was to help uh, help with workplace environment uh, and positive relationships with labor and management and, and that. And so this is work that's already underway. And, and this, these are um, 
consultants and that's one of their specialties. So I guess I'm just curious, do you think this is something that um, the, the workers are really supporting and they want to see it followed through and it's going well working with this company so far? I do. We have a very enthusiastic culture team that's been established in 911 and they are uh, they're very enthusiastic and have had some early and quick successes and although they're still a fledgling uh, group in the organization and um, they do need continued development and support. Okay, I appreciate that and um, uh, I don't think I have any other questions. You can. Um, Council Member Reich. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I mean, the Council's desire was to, to address uh, many of the challenges of a very challenging workplace environment. This is one of many um, activities that we had encouraged, including increased staffing and so um, if this is what it takes to get the work that we desire to get done, I, I think we have to endorse it by, by the very nature of our intent. So and I'm strongly endorse it with the effort and very much appreciate the uh, progress we've made. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I'll add that uh, 911, running a 911 center um, is a full-time job, as is undertaking a workplace culture initiative. And so bringing in a professional uh, firm that has a track record already with the city in working with reg services and in uh, putting on the leadership U training citywide for department leadership uh, seemed like a prudent choice. Council Member Gordon. I thought of my other question now. Um, I'm curious if you have a labor management team that's set up as part of this? Yes, we do. Uh, we have actually revitalized our labor management committee and our co-chairs just received training last week at the Twin Cities Labor Management Council and we'll be beginning, beginning our, um, our refreshed labor management meetings uh, soon. We've also had a labor management scheduling committee that just completed their work in designing our demand-based schedule for 2015. And that was done with uh, full transparency and participation from both labor and management. Well, wonderful. Um, so I'm assuming because of this refresh, the Labor Management Committee hasn't necessarily reviewed this proposal, or have they? Uh, no, okay. we haven't met yet. Well, I, um, I'm definitely supportive of this. It's also good to hear that the Labor Management team is up and, and and running, I think that um, a message I'd like you to get from the committee and from the council is that we support you and we support the dispatchers and, and the um, um, everybody who works down there and answers the phone, uh, um, the operators to, um, we, to improve their working conditions, make it a great place to work, um, and we really value what, uh, what they do for the city and what you do for the city. Thank you, that is the goal to make 911 a great place to work. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, um, I will move for approval of item number three. All those in favor, or any discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And the fourth item, um, I will invite uh, Ms. Siegel and Mr. Gender, or either of you to come up. <clears throat> Well, uh, Chair Yang and members of the committee, I'm Susan Siegel, I'm the Minneapolis City Attorney, and I want to uh, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you uh, today. Uh, you have asked our office to look into what legal options there are uh, to try to prevent uh, the Washington professional football team um, uh, from playing at uh, TCF Stadium. Um, at its scheduled game on November 2nd. Uh, and we approached this uh, assignment from the perspective of uh, knowing that we're in uncharted territory, but trying to fully explore the issue and uh, trying to see if we really had uh, any standing or any ability uh, to uh, pursue a claim 
as long as we could avoid uh, Rule 11 sanctions. <laughs> um, so we did really quite um, extensive uh, research, and I must say that um, personally, and I know that members of my office share this, we would have we would like nothing better uh, than to be able to file uh, a lawsuit and uh, um, help provoke a long overdue uh, change in the name uh, of this team. Um, first, I think there's absolutely no question that the NFL is now an extreme outlier with respect to team names uh, and that the Washington team name needs to change. We need look no further really than our own kids right here in the city of Minneapolis to uh, see the impact of this kind of a racially derogatory name uh, on our own kids. Um, uh, kids from living at Little Earth of United Tribes here in South Minneapolis made comments such as, it is offensive, racist, and mocks our culture. It's broadcast worldwide, it's really public. We are not cartoons. Uh, there's a research report, and I've included a link in the uh, um, PowerPoint slide to the changethemascot.org website, which links to this research report. Uh, this, research, this research report concludes uh, on the impact of um, the Washington football mascot, um, that it's uniquely destructive, and I'm quoting here from the report because it not only perpetuates the stereotypical and outdated character portrayed by many Native American mascots, but also promotes and justifies the use of a dictionary-defined racial slur, thus increasing risk for discriminatory experiences against Native Americans. And if that was not bad enough, uh, the, the report uh, cites to studies that have shown that discrimination in the form of racial slurs, racial harassment, and bullying is associated with poor mental health among Native American children and adults. The report also cites to studies showing that it impacts academic achievement. And I know that there were some uh, just very recent studies, because I was listening to them on NPR as I was driving home the other day, uh, proving that if you tell kids that they're not very good, they're not very capable, and they're not very smart, uh, before they take a test, they do worse than the kids who are told they're actually pretty smart and pretty good, and that they are not, uh, you know, the equivalent of, of a, a, a racial, racially derogatory slur. Uh, the report concludes that anything that causes additional stress or increased suffering among this uh, highly discriminated against group of individuals must be considered a public health um, priority. And uh, I don't need to repeat the statistics here. Um, high school graduation rates are abysmal. Um, uh, Native American people in the United States exhibit the highest level of psychological distress of any other group in the nation, including among the highest levels of depression, substance abuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The Native American suicide rate is among the highest in the country and has risen by an alarming 65% in the last decade alone. Need I say any more on this topic? Um, since the early 1960s, uh, the Native American community and other groups uh, have really worked on this issue of changing Native American themed mascots, nicknames, uh, and team names, et cetera. And it has not been without progress. One of the, the um, uh, most impressive uh, developments uh, has, been, uh, com has come from an unexpected place, the United States Patent uh, and Trademark Office. And there was just a decision that came out uh, in the spring of this year uh, invalidating uh, trademark registration for the team name um, and logo. This is the second time that the Patent and Trademark Office uh, has done this. The first time ultimately was overturned, but it was overturned on a technicality on a legal defense called latches, meaning the individuals had waited too long to bring 
um, the claim. Uh, the team's response to this decision uh, was that they filed suit against the five Native American plaintiffs. Um, and I think they made a procedural mistake there, um, and we'll see what the uh, federal district court in the District of Columbia does. But obviously there's huge promise because if you uh, take away the trademark registrations, uh, the team is going to lose money, and the NFL will also be financially impacted. And there's no more strong a message that can be delivered uh, than a financial one. Now, the evidence in the case I thought was also worth repeating. Um, the case focused on the 1965 to 1990 uh, time frame um, to decide whether the uh, uh, team name was, in fact, uh, disparaging and offensive. And evidence that was presented included all major dictionaries in the country. And beginning in 1966 forward, uh, the Washington team name was defined as uh, disparaging and offensive and had what they call special usage um, guidance. And my understanding, although I have not looked through every dictionary from 1986, is that the dictionaries uh, have been unanimous since that year in labeling the term as being uh, offensive. Um, another thing that they looked at was the National Congress of American Indians um, and their statement on how offensive um, uh, this term is to uh, Native Americans. Another uh, important development um, is that the NCAA the National College Athletic Association finally in 2005 decided to make it a requirement of participation in the NCAA um, to say that no Native American team nicknames or mascots uh, can be used any longer if you want to participate in NCAA activities. Um, and as a result of that change, uh, 19 colleges and universities uh, changed their nicknames. And we are all being here in Minnesota, border state to North Dakota, I have read about um, the battles uh, 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 that North Dakota went through in changing the University of North Dakota Fighting Sioux name, but in fact, Fighting Sioux has been gone now for a few years. Um, the voters of North Dakota rejected uh, continuing that name uh, by a margin of 67%. Uh, public pressure. Uh, very important, uh, and we now have uh, multiple government leaders, the President of the United States, our governor, the City Council of the City of Minneapolis, um, no less, uh, as well as many others, along with, for the, uh, in recent years, sportscasters, who are now refusing to use the team name um, on air. The Washington Post editorial board uh, recently said that they are no longer going to use uh, the team name in the newspaper. Um, important areas for public pressure, uh, again, because it deals with uh, the success of the NFL, is that uh, the tax exemption for the NFL is a trade association. I know that uh, uh, members of our federal delegation uh, have spoken about that, as well as the NFL enjoys an exemption from the antitrust laws, another fertile area for exploration. Uh, coming finally to the question that you asked us to answer, uh, can the city bring a cause of action? And uh, we are, un unfortunately, I think we've come to the conclusion that the city uh, itself does not have a cause of action against the team that is likely to be uh, successful. Uh, in some ways, we are about the worst plaintiff uh, you can try to find for an expansion of the law in this area. Um, first of all, we're a government, so obviously the First Amendment applies to us and everything we do. Um, and there's, uh, in particular, when you're talking about trying to bring an, bring an action for an injunction um, be before speech has occurred, um, there's a ban on prior restraints. Uh, the most fruitful area, and I'll talk about this a little later, is, is possibly looking at the discrimination laws and uh, particularly the public accommodation uh, provisions of those laws. 
and there have been cases uh, brought under those laws successfully for creating a hostile environment. Generally, those have been in school districts where schools have failed um, to do something about bullying and those sorts of things. Um, but I think that is a possible area. However, the city would have no standing to bring that kind of a claim. That's the kind of a claim that an, an aggrieved individual um, would have to uh, bring forward and could uh, pursue either by filing a charge of discrimination um, or uh, you know, State Human Rights Act, for example, allows a suit to be brought directly into court. Um, again, it's a bit uncharted, but you know, I think there's a good faith uh, basis there for pursuing that kind of a claim. Um, and we also have uh, a Minnesota Court of Appeals decision from 1984 telling us that our civil rights ordinance uh, does not cover the University of Minnesota. Uh, the Court of Appeals reason that the University of Minnesota is a state agency, therefore the city of Minneapolis as a municipal entity or, or civil rights commission just does not have jurisdiction over the University of Minnesota. Um, that would be the Minnesota Human Rights Act. So what alternatives um, are there, as I already mentioned? Uh, individual claims uh, for hostile environment, public accommodation discrimination, and there could be others. There are great legal minds out there. I don't want to limit anything. The Maryland Civil Rights Code, for example, and Maryland is the state in which the stadium where the Washington team plays their that is their home stadium, is located in the state of Maryland. Um, their civil rights code uh, prohibits public accommodation discrimination, and it specifically calls out uh, stadiums as being included as a type of public accommodation. Uh, and it's possible, and there was a law review article we found, I think, from the early 1990s where a law professor posited that you might be able to argue there's enough of a nexus there um, that you might be able to bring uh, a successful claim. We did not research, although we did not find in our research that any such claims had been brought, um, uh, but um, you know, we, we did not uh, uh, you know, do an exhaustive search under Maryland uh, state case law. Um, and then as I already mentioned, the congressional review of tax and antitrust exemptions uh, for the NFL. Um, and then ultimately, um, it's really public opinion. And who are the sponsors for the team? Um, should people be putting pressure on those sponsors? Um, and I just end with a quote um, from Joey Browner, who's a former Minnesota Vikings player and a Native American, and I understand a, uh, an AIM board member uh, as well, um, about his opinion on whether or not um, the name uh, should be changed. He points out that the team's making multi-billions over a word that was something uh, that historically a bounty was put up for for hunting season for scouts. Um, and then are there, are there any questions? I brought along my First Amendment constitutional scholar, Peter Ginder, <laughs> who has helped with the research as well. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Siegel, thank you, and thank you to your office as well for uh, doing this. Um, council members, anyone with any questions? Council Member Gordon. I'm curious if you think there would be any difference um, in terms of what stadium they're playing at um, and what standing we would have, because I know this, this game in November this year and next year, presumably, and uh, maybe the year after, it's going to be at the university stadium. But this team has played at um, the stadium that maybe we're part owners of. I'm not exactly sure how we would define that, but the new Vikings, the old, they used to play at the Metrodome, and they will be playing at the new a Viking Stadium. Um, so do you think that would change our legal standing? Uh, it potentially, it, it could. It would be arguing um, for an expansion of the term of public accommodation. Um, you know, the stadium authority, uh, you know, would be traditionally the public accommodation. And then at some level you run into Again, the First Amendment with whether we like it or not protects, you know, really hateful speech as well as speech that we favor. So does it create a hostile, is it sufficient to create a hostile environment? So it, it seems like we could make that case and maybe appeal to the stadium authority. It, it, 
And maybe there's even something that we could clarify. I don't, you, you mentioned that the Maryland code specifically includes stadiums. Um, and it seems like this uh, name could create a uh, hostile environment for um, Native Americans who want to attend or be there or be part of that. Uh, and it's unhealthy. And it, it would add, there's actually some evidence that um, it, it has long repercussions. I happen to believe that um, that this is part of a, a larger problem uh, and this whole uh, way that we can keep um, certain groups oppressed uh, and there's subtle things we've put into our culture and into our um, our country um, and I think that uh, derogatory terms against Native Americans goes back a long long way and actually allowed people who lived in Minnesota um, 150 years ago or more to think it was okay to treat them as subhumans and to, to exile them and to, to kill them. So um, this is a vestige of that. And so um, I think it is very much connected to our civil rights efforts and our movement and our code. So I'm looking for any handle or anything that we can have. And I, I appreciate you coming back with this information and gives us a lot to think about. Council member Wright? No? Okay. Um, any other um, comments, questions from council members? Right, seeing none, um, Ms. Siegel, again, I, I wanted to thank your office uh, for um, doing all the work, um, this presentation, just uh, doing the best your office could in terms of, you know, helping us to understand this issue. And, um, you know, I mean, hopefully our pressure from, you know, this committee, from this council, from other parts of this country will change his name. So thank you so much. Hey, Mr. Chair, thank you. And hopefully we won't have to have this discussion a year from now because the name will have been changed. Thank you. Um, council members, um, I'm going to move to receive and file this report. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion carries. And this is it, I think. So seeing no further business before this committee, um, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all very much.